Welcome to Profiling Evil Conversations with Mike King. For the past 40 years, I've had the distinct privilege of working with law enforcement all around the world. Today, we're going to talk about the missing persons case of Suzanne Morphew, a woman from Colorado. I'm joined by my longtime friend and colleague, Detective Chris McDonough. Chris worked in the Oceanside, California Police Department. He's a nationally recognized expert who's appeared on NBC, CBS's 48 Hours, the BBC, and even the Oprah Winfrey Show. He's investigated hundreds of death cases. We've had the chance to consult on cases all around the United States. Hey, Chris, thanks for taking time to join tonight. Hey, Mike, thank you. Appreciate having the opportunity to be here. Oh, it's awesome to have you here. I, I just appreciate our relationship over the years. I thought we'd just spend a little time and chat about Suzanne Morphew, this 49-year-old mother of two who was reported missing on May 10th of this year. It was Mother's Day, if you remember. What a horrible day to go disappearing. Uh, she reportedly left her Maysville, Colorado home to go on a bike ride that morning. You know, initially this case garnered a lot of attention but there really hasn't been a lot said about the case in, until um, now with us talking about it. The sheriff's office apparently did serve another search warrant today, which is interesting. Yeah, you know, this is uh, one of those, you know, tragic situations that, uh, you know, uh, what would we call it a career case, right? This is, you know, a mother uh, goes out on a bike ride on Mother's Day um, her bicycle is found, you know, for or her neighbor reports that dad's away uh, at work uh, in Denver. The kids are camping. She has two daughters, I believe, or, you know, and so uh, it's a it's just a tragedy all the way around. And you know, uh, this whole thing kicks off with the first responding officer, you know, kind of getting that frantic call about a uh, missing woman. Yeah, you know, I've, I've read a few people online who have been really distraught by the fact that the family's gone on Mother's Day. I think about uh, the careers you and I live right now where uh, pre-COVID, uh, we ended up being away on a lot of holidays because of law enforcement conferences that were happening around the, the U.S. and abroad. Uh, but is there anything that bugs you about this? It's Mother's Day. Yeah, no, that's, it, it's just... Uh it's we we call it a who done it right i mean it's a, one of these is it an accident is it you know suspicious is it foul play uh, all of those um, unknowns you know on the initial um, contact with this first officer on the scene are are it sets the stage for why we're sitting here right now you know yeah you you know you you've uh, been the patrol officer. I've been the patrol officer responding on these missing persons cases. Uh, it's not against the law to, to go missing. In fact, I, I'm surprised when I look at the statistics. For the last 30 uh, years, we have averaged about 600,000 adults every single year who turn up missing. Now, uh, the National Crime Information Center suggests that 83% of them come home eventually, but that means like 104,000 people disappear every single year and they're never heard from again. It, that's crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's these, those types of statistics, you know, you kind of step back and you say, you know, well, what the heck is going on here? And I, I think, you know, it, it's for another day, but I think, you know, that whole conversation of, what the internet has brought and, you know, sexual predatory behaviors and that kind of stuff that's kind of evolved. Uh, you know, this is obviously has to be a consideration in that first response, in that patrol officer's mind, as either he or she is getting on yeah. that scene. They've got to be thinking, okay, you know, what do I have here on Mother's Day, right? I mean, it couldn't get any worse other than, you know, maybe, you know, Christmas, <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> It's yeah, a, you, know. you know, something was really different about this case, though. And, yeah. and you know, I, I think a lot of our listeners want to know how cops think when they're responding to cases like this. And, and I want to break it down a little bit. But 
really something was different for the way in which they responded. And you mentioned it earlier, there, this idea of the who done it. Uh, one of the things that I think we fight with as investigators is that too often we walk in and that's what we want to do is just solve the thing, the, solve the, the who done it. In reality, what we need to do is, is think about who is this victim and why did they become a victim? And that we call that victimology, this study of who they are. Uh, I really want to know more about who Suzanne Morphew is. And you and I have been doing a little research into her background. The questions that really pop up are, are who is Suzanne? And why did she disappear? And yeah. then of course, if she, with her disappearing, what happened on May 10th that changed the, this family's reality? Yeah, so one of the things obviously that, you know, that first uh, responding officer is going to do is set the tone, right, for the investigators. <clears throat> and so typically, you know, by protocol, you want to slow everything down. Uh, because at this point, no matter what it is, uh, for an investigation, time is on your side. So he's, he or she's going to initially ask those, you know, those prying questions about the victim you know tell it tell me about the victim you know when were they last seen who were they last talking to uh and all of those you know that q a that's going to go on uh is going to really set the path for the investigation as it starts to move forward um so you have this um officer you know whoever this individual is um, immediately there were some red flags that went up in the air because all of a sudden there were some resources that were pressured right into this whole problem. So what we know about her right now, and maybe some of these could have been the red flags, is you know, she, it, she's you know, a mother of two, uh, somewhat of a you know, long marriage, 30-something years, which is a, sounds like a stable marriage, uh, you know, initial, you know, information presented to the officers. Uh, goes out, very athletic. Uh, she's a vibrant woman based on some of the descriptions of neighbors, friends, you know, very outgoing, the kind of gal that you want to, you know, hang out with. Uh, probably a great friend, very loyal. She uh, uh, was a cancer survivor, uh, battled cancer twice. Uh, wow. And she, she, she set up a, a foundation for children who, you know, uh, a Christian foundation, a 501c3, right when she moved to the Colorado area. Uh, so, you know, you have a, 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 a young woman here who, you know, has a lot of life ahead of her. And so you want to make sure that officer is now processing potentially this information initially to say, okay, you know, this could be, you know, something I need to get some resources on quickly. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. You know, as we, as we work through this process of figuring mm -hmm. out who the victim is, uh, we, we apply a principle we call a victim risk continuum where we, we try to determine what level of risk this person is in. And people can go back and look at other shows that I've done on the victim risk continuum, but the idea is that um, when we understand the level of risk, we can start to get a picture painted of who the offender might be in this case. Uh, I feel like this is probably someone in her basic day-to-day -day life is a really low-risk individual. How, how do you feel about that assessment? No, I, I would agree with you uh, 100% based on everything that, you know, we can just read off of, you know, the, the story and right now. Uh, I think everybody would agree that, yeah, this is a very, very low risk uh, victim now. So that means, you know, there's some other possibilities that present themselves, right? Uh, that's a great point. I mean, statistically, and, and uh, uh, there's always the anomaly, but statistically, a low risk victim is victimized by someone who is known to them. And the really frightening part to me is that not only are they known to them, but when they are victimized, they're a target of the aggression that was placed against them. Uh, th there are some obvious people to look at in this case if she were uh, classified only in this way without any other evidence brought into the picture. But 
but there's some really important evidence that needs to be brought into the picture because if the reports are accurate and she goes out on a bike ride, suddenly her situation, her circumstances and her environment change and could propel her from being a low risk victim to somebody who becomes medium or even high risk based on the different kinds of things that could happen to her. Uh, what would be some of those kinds of things that would change her risk level in your opinion? Um, yeah, you would have, you know, you'd have, now you want to start thinking about, you know, outside influences in relationship to, you know, was there, uh, you know, was there a predatorial behavior around her? You know, that she's out in the mountains. Um, you know, are there, what's the, what's the roads, who, who travels those roads and are there paths? Uh, I think that within inside of that geographic region, there are hiking paths. So, you know, that, that in of itself, you know, raises, you know, a risk uh, that, you know, who's actually going down those paths? Is she a target at that point? You know, is she, you know, does she ride her bike? You know, you, so you want to go into her habits. You know, is she riding her bike consistently, you know, down this road to get to her main, you know, bike ride? I mean, and, you know, we worked in, you know, I worked in Southern California, so you would see every Saturday, man, these bikes, these guys on their bikes, man, they're, they're hitting that road and they're going from, you know, Oceanside to San Diego on that Highway 1 religiously. Yeah, yeah. Is she that mentality? And if so, that means, you know, she could have been, you know, uh, somebody could be paying attention to her that may have uh, you know other 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 things on their mind you know yeah or, or, or frankly she could be out on a road and nobody's paying attention to her and strikes her in their vehicle and her risk level because of that circumstance and and the environment yeah. suddenly propels her into this high risk category hey um, can you see the map Chris I maybe you ought to take a minute and just talk a little bit about the area since you've been talking and mentioning it yeah, I can share. Go ahead. Well, I, a couple of things that I found were interesting when we started looking at this. Uh, we can see the Morphew home, and and if we were to look at this just strictly from an elevation standpoint, it really is a, probably a higher point than many of the homes in that area. It was a really nice home. I mean, a million and a half dollars or so. Um, but in the uh, investigation that and in the information that I read online, the police talked about or people talked about a number of uh, different kinds of locations. One was that the bike was located by a bridge. You know, in looking on the map, there actually were a couple of locations that were bridges. As we learn more information, and especially after we saw a video uh, from a, a, a amazing young man that's gonna get online with us here in a minute, um, it, it looks more probably that the bike uh, was discovered near the creek on this end to the west of the Morphew home. And that there was also a personal item that was found alongside the highway, uh, gosh, 200 plus feet away from the location of the bike. Uh, what do you find kind of significant about just looking at the geography for a moment? Uh, you know, so you, you know, we, we go back to that conversation or just a second ago where so we have a we have a thoroughfare here. This looks like a pretty well traveled um, type of road, right? So that raises that risk level up by where her personal item is. Uh, I think that area is also a well hiked uh, kind of you know bike trails that kind of stuff uh, that run alongside the the river there. Um, in fact, uh, that young man uh, Tyson. Uh, he, I saw, I watched his video where, you know, he pretty much did a pretty good, you know, video of, you know, laying out what the geographic, um, you know, uh, terrain looks like. So you have a couple of things. One, you can even see some of the cars in that, in that, uh, that you just pulled up there, Mike, going by. So that, that's, you know, that, that's big right there. You've got people parked there. Uh, so every one of those individuals, I mean, this is, I know, you know, just a, a, a shot or, you know, a satellite shot, but you got to take that into consideration, you know, initially when the investigation starts kicking off. Who has access to this particular region? And so then you've got to think through, okay, well, 
you know, obviously from our perspective, you know, and, and your perspective on the behavioral analysis side, you know, what kind of personalities are attracted to this particular region? And, you know, what's the threat assessment in relationship to those personalities? Well, 99% of them are just, you know, good people that go hiking, okay? They're, they like to do all kinds of good things. But we have to think in the abstract of that 1%. You know, yeah, good point. You know, and so you start looking at other things. So you start looking at offenders uh, in the area, yeah, you know, and then you start eliminating them one-on-one. -on -one. But more importantly, you know, you want to kind of focus in on what, what she was thinking, you know, if you can, you know, and you have to piece that through interviews, you know, what are, what are her routines? And, and then yeah, that Yeah, so let me ask you something, though. I, I, I find this little parking area that you were talking about really intriguing. It, it's mm -hmm. almost like a rideshare area. Um, what I think uh, we'll, we'll learn is that it probably is a place where people just park and go hiking or they unload their bike and head up in the mountains and go, go biking. If, if this was a predatory event that occurred in the daylight hours, according to reports, how probable is it that a predator would feel comfortable right there taking a victim and, and abducting them? Yeah, so this isn't a situation that's in there, you know, advantageous, right? I mean, they, if they had the, the shield of, you know, the camouflage, uh, you know, they very well could, you know, situate themselves into a position of advantage and then quickly strike and you know move on um, so i say this is you know this is a 50 50 type of situation hey we'd like to welcome to the show today tyson draper of tiger adventures tyson is an amazing young man who recently discovered uh, barry morphew walking along a trail his story is amazing uh, but before we get started, uh, Tyson, take a moment and tell us what in the heck are you doing in Maysville, Colorado? <laughs> Good question. Good question. There's not much out there to see. So take us there. I mean, you're you're pulling into the little uh, park and ride parking lot where people drop their bikes and stuff off. What what happens? Oh, yeah, so right there where the 225 and the 50 come together, um, it's it's way up there in the mountains. And um, and we're putting it up on a map, Tyson. We're putting the map up to kind of help people orient while you're talking. Oh, I got you. I got you. Okay, so if you see the 225 and the 50, there's a little pull out there. And I was coming from the opposite direction, like where if you go up over, I think it's called Monarch Pass. Um, to the it, to the west, I came, and I whipped into that little spot right there, and and I look behind me, and Barry Morphew's truck is right behind me, and it comes around the corner, and it just starts creeping past. He didn't look at me, but I got a good look at him as he was going by, and he just he just looked awful in that moment. Hmm. That's something. Did you get a did you? Did you get a chance to talk to him? So not not at that time. He went by and and it was it was registering in my brain that that was him. And by that time, he was already a good you know forty yards down the road or whatever. And I didn't get a chance to talk to him. But I thought, well, he I know he lives up here, and so I'll walk up there. Or I'll kind of look around and and take some footage and stuff, and then I'll take my truck up there. And I started to walk around, and I noticed a big barricade that says, do not enter, road closed. And then there was some signs that said, like, private property and whatever. Yeah. And so I just stopped there and got out, and I said, well, this is the path right here that Suzanne Morphew would have rode on that day. And I kind of filmed the, the road there a little bit. And, uh, and I started thinking, I'm like, well, if all this video surveillance is out here, why do we not have any video of Suzanne leaving that day on her bike? You know, but yeah, maybe yeah. law enforcement does and we just haven't seen it yet. I don't know. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Um, as you come out of the Morphew House and you head down toward where the bike was discovered, there's one point on the map where it looks like it's about a hundred foot uh, drop, a pretty steep grade in the road. What What did you think when you were looking through that area? Oh yeah, so that's coming down directly off of like Puma Pass, and um, it's a pretty steep hill. Uh, and it, it turns at the end and as you come down this hill and it's a sharp curve it bottlenecks over there's a little bridge there there's a creek and I started to think you know maybe Suzanne Morphy was coming down this hill on her bicycle and she got up too much speed or, or something happened or a car came by and ran her off the road and uh, I'm walking back down the road and I see that same truck that I saw yesterday it, that I thought I saw Barry Morphew in. And I turned around, and sure enough, it was him and his, mo- and his mom, passenger seat. And so I waved, and he stopped and rolled down the window and kind of asked what was going on, and I told him. And, and I, I said, well, you know, I, I drove all the way over here to, kind of help with the search is is there anything you you need and he threw it in park real quick without saying a word and jumped out and left the truck sitting right in the middle of the road with his mom in there and he said let me show you what happened hey if i can stop you there um let, let me let me play that clip and see if you can just talk uh we'll talk through a couple of these little things and uh, just uh, make sure you can that you can hear this so we searched a 200 mile radius what really all of the mountains have been covered so far but obviously we're gonna miss things right so let me show you what happened um and i do have a reward there is a reward two hundred and ten thousand dollar reward Whoa. um the bike was found at the bottom of the hill by that tree where the peak is. Oh, really? So I'll stop it right there, Tyson. Well, it was one of those moments in life that, you know, you kind of got to pinch yourself to, to see if it's really happening. I thought it was weird then, and I, I still think it's weird today, how he just jumped out and just gushed this information to me. And if you listen to it or if you watch the transcription of it, you'll see that I hardly said anything. I just listened. Hey, Tyson, uh, a quick question. From the day prior to this encounter, what was different about him, if anything, from when you saw him go by you? Was he dressed the same? Can you unpack that for me? Help me, help us understand that. Mm -hmm. He just looked totally like distraught. I mean, that's the word I always use. I don't, I can't think of any other word. He was just distraught and he, his hair was all disheveled. He was uh, bright red. I mean, his, you know, cause he didn't have a shirt on. His torso was red. He was soaking wet and he was, he had his chest up against the steering wheel. Like he was kind of just like banging on it kind of, you know, like, like he was frustrated. It is, was there any doubt it, it was, the same truck and the the same guy in your mind at that point no there's no there's no doubt there's okay. no doubt play that tyson okay um the first night there was a mountain lion the officer seen it walk by the car so we thought maybe she got attacked by a lion we thought maybe she wrecked we're coming down this hill a car coming around the corner fast maybe was disoriented and got in the river we've covered it all of this really good, this triangle, with search and rescue. So we're pretty comfortable that she's not in this triangle between the RV park, your truck, this road, and then the next road. But. Hey, Tyson, one, one question. Is the river behind you then? Are we looking at the road going up to 50? So yeah, the creek okay. was um yeah the creek was right like right in front of us down that hill right so as you're filming him it, the creek was right behind you yes what okay. was the flow 
the the flow of the creek was very strong, very strong. If someone was in that creek, could they have been swept downstream? Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt it was very strong. I think Barry mentioned in that video, if I remember right, he was saying something about how maybe she uh, she rolled down that hill and got disoriented and wound up in the creek and floated down. That was another one of his theories, you know. So we're, we're at the point where he's saying maybe she's abducted right what here. What seems to have happened from the investigators, and they don't give much, and I've got private people working for me, is maybe she was abducted right here. And they found an article going west of hers. They won't tell us what it is. So they sent another team after they found the article that covered this hillside all the way down to the river pretty good my concerns were this way and that way if it was the cat because the cats they dragged their prey up the mountain and out of people's we can't find sign for the cat but we got rain like right yeah, away yeah. could have washed away sign so um, they found a What do you remember there, Tyson? Just remember, like, thinking, wow, you know, like, this guy's talking about this cat dragging his wife up the hill and eating her and tearing her, tearing her up or whatever, and there's no emotion. You know, there's no... Uh, it wasn't the same Barry that I, that I, you know, saw in the the one that he put out where he was like, oh, Suzanne, you know, we we need you or whatever. It, it was a whole different thing. And I hate to judge people like that because, you know, you really don't know what goes on behind closed doors and all that, but there was a stark, like, difference. Interesting. It, you did a great job, by the way. Just be, you know, the, I want to get that on the record here. It was fantastic. I mean, it's just this opportunity presented itself. You you did the right thing. Yeah, you talked you talked about the fact that you really didn't have to ask many questions. He took kind of a commanding lead and and delivered his message to you, and then it was over. Yeah. Yep. Let Let's listen to the rest of this right against that tree down well, there? Well, no, it was on the ground. Oh, was, the uh, wheel was facing the, and the, and the uh, uh, sheriff department, uh, they screwed everything up. They shouldn't have touched it. All the way left. It's oh. evidence. Pulled it up. And the sheriff had, we had cars over here where well, the sheriff let everybody drive through here covering all, or messing up all the evidence. They were walking all over this area which if somebody abducted her, they would have had foot tracks. They would have had fingerprints yeah. on the bike. And they now let, they let 10 other people touch the bike. Oh, man. I mean, we was really upset that first night. But I was yeah. in Denver, so. Yeah, let's, let's stop there for a minute. So he's given us a couple of thoughts. One is the mountain lion. One is the bike crash mixed with the abduction. And now just the fact that law enforcement has uh, botched the investigation. What, what was your thinking as that was all unfolding? Well, it was odd that he had like three or four scenarios on the tip of his tongue and just gushed them out like one right after the other. Um, I just, what I was thinking is this whole experience is just odd. You know, the stuff that he's saying isn't making a whole lot of sense. Um, it, it, it was almost like it was, um, it was rehearsed. And, and also I felt like we didn't, well, let me tell you this, Mike and Chris, um, when you first meet somebody for the very first time, don't you want to kind of know who you're talking to? Don't you ask them questions like, Hey, where are you from? And, um, you know, what do you do for a living? I don't know. Just basic questions, right? Not once did he ever stop and ask me, like, okay, so who are you? And, like, why are you looking for my wife? And, by the way, thank you for looking for my wife. 
you know, yeah. like nothing. Those are you know? really interesting behavioral things, yeah. What do you think of that, Chris? No, I, I think I, I, I'm i just struck that, uh, you know, that that's a great point that you just brought up, buddy, because, you know, here, you know, here, here's a guy who's, uh, you know, you're meeting, like you said. Uh, what strikes me, though, is he's talking... Uh, I don't know if you caught it, Tyson. He's talking in the plural. We. He keeps talking about we. Really? No, yeah. I didn't catch it. Um, well, but so do you know if if he got there the night the bike was discovered? Do you know that? Or did he come after the fact? And did somebody tell him about this story that he's relating to you about how the sheriff's handled it? Because... You know that that would be interesting you know from your perspective what what are your thoughts on that let's see how did it go he he didn't get back from denver until nine o'clock that night let's put it that way and he was telling everybody that he was there when they brought the bike up the hill and when the neighbor you know did this and that and the girls did this and that but he wasn't and, and then he contradicted himself by saying he got there at nine o'clock that night so when he's talking about them pulling law enforcement that is pulling the bicycle up the hill and 10 people touching it da 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 you got to remember he wasn't there he was in denver <laughs> till nine o'clock that night yeah, so i don't know really where he got i mean where did he get that information law enforcement's not going to come tell him oh hey man we let 10 people touch this bike and we wiped it down and we, we destroyed all the where did he get this information from you know well, we're asking the same question. <laughs> or did he make or did he make it up? You know, or did he make it up? I mean, so Yeah. Let's let's uh listen to this last uh couple of seconds where, where he talks about being in Denver and his friend. Oh, you were I didn't okay. get here until nine o'clock that night. Yeah. And my friend's an army ranger and he knows this stuff better than anybody. Uh -huh. He did four hundred tours in Iraq Afghanistan. Oh, is that and so it ends there. What was your thought when he said that? Well, I started to think, well, shoot, man, he's got a whole bunch of people working this case. He made it sound like he had this this um, Rambo-style guy that did 400 tours in Iraq, and he's, he's like a hound dog, man. He just gets out there and tracks whatever. And so I thought he had all, like, this army of people on this but i found out later that he doesn't so at least that's what you know a credible source told me that that was kind of all smoke and mirrors yeah well tyson you you uh should be very pleased with what you were able to uncover i mean that's amazing that you stumbled across him two times uh the chances of that I find really remarkable. The fact that he would speak to you, I find remarkable. Uh, has law enforcement reached out to you to interview you? Yes, I talked to the uh, CBI on two different occasions. Good, good. We don't want you to talk about any of that. Um, just wanted to make sure that, that you've had a chance to share with them what you learned. I, 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 I really respect you, my friend. I mean, this is... You did a phenomenal job. I mean, just you know, for you, I don't be hard. Don't be so hard on yourself. I, I watched your videos, and Mike and I, you know, both have commented, man, that this guy is good. He did well. He did really well. So good for you. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, guys, and uh, I'm learning as I go. I've made lots of mistakes, but I feel like that's all of us, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Well, Tyson. Um, but before we before we um, say goodbye, I'd like you just to take a minute and tell people how to find you on YouTube, and uh, and and hopefully we'll we'll drive a few people your way. And and please, when we release this, man, replay it on your side. And make sure you tell them and, and invite us to come over and and say hello on your channel sometime. You can just find me. Just go to the search bar on YouTube and type in my name T Y S O N. D-R-A-P-E-R, -E Tyson Draper, and all my stuff should pop up there. So, 
and then they have to hit that subscribe button and the and the bell right so that when you put a new video up they they know you're on what what an amazing person that was uh, awesome. really fun yeah that guy's awesome yeah Love that that was great well you know chris uh i think it's pretty clear the sheriff's office took this thing seriously and they uh began immediately starting to put together their investigation uh, obviously it's mother's day something is really suspicious and they start calling out the troops i mean uh, who did they bring out and, and why is that so significant so early in an investigation like a missing person? You know, uh, they're, they're working under that, that uh, window of time, right, Mike, where we, we know that, you know, you have a, well, they, you know, the, the old saying, the first 48, right? I mean, really, when you're, when you're dealing with a missing person, you don't know if that first 48 hours is, has already been evaporated, right? Because you don't know if there's a couple of days that happened or a couple, you know, some circumstances that happened a couple of days before, you know, and what part of uh, the time frame are you in? So immediately putting resources into this, to your point, you know, to see that you can tell that this sheriff's department up there, I mean, this is not their first rodeo. That The, the sheriff up there, I did a little research on him, you know, he... He's a very experienced uh, guy. He's got a team of investigators. I know some of the guys up at CBI. You know, there there's a sharp. There are some sharp forensics, sharp sharp people uh, on this case right now. And I think the hardest part, you know, looking in from the outside, looking through the window, uh, for just people and ourselves. I mean, myself included. You know, it, it's difficult to be patient, uh, but these investigations when they're put into motion there are so many dynamics that that immediately come to play and that window gets narrower and narrower but what people forget as investigators you only get one shot at it if you make a mistake that is going to multiply itself in a courtroom okay down the road so the best you know, the best advice that anybody's ever given, you know, for investigators is slow down. Yeah, and, and I've heard you say it a, a hundred times in, you know, watching you, you know, train is, you know, don't ask how this happened, but ask why, you know, why was this scenario? Why did it present itself the way it has? And if, and if she was selected as a victim or, you know, you know, God forbid if it is her husband, you know, at this, you know, juncture down the road, um, you know, why? What, why did he do what he did or why did the other person do what they did? You know, so right now, patience is a virtue uh, for an investigator, even though they're 60 days into it. I think tomorrow's the anniversary um, of, of her missing. You got a lot of people impacted uh, on this side and, but... You know, some of his some of his statements are, are much more valuable than some of the other evidence that's going to come forth. So Tyson really has blown this thing uh, into another atmosphere. So good for him. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. What he's added is behavior that otherwise we wouldn't have the benefit of seeing or law enforcement wouldn't have the benefit of seeing. That's pretty amazing. The, the sheriff's office has done a, a remarkable job of keeping things close to the cuff, too, and not uh, exposing. It really frustrates the public who is so used to being able to just get information whenever they want it. But this is really critical in an investigation like this, to have a few things that only you and the suspect know. Uh, and you hope that maybe only the suspect thinks that they know and and you're holding something what, what's the value of that yeah well the interview room right when you get into the interview room you know and you're talking to you know a subject who you know you have a suspicion and you have all the evidence pointing to this particular individual and then they say something that only you the victim and the suspect would know and you 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 know you're able through a cognitive interview process, you know, link those pieces 
of of this puzzle together i mean so you know i've always i've always viewed it as you know you look at this gigantic puzzle and then you have that one corner <laughs> of that puzzle piece you know that you just know it's missing it's it, it's been missing and maybe you were the one as the investigator that took that puzzle piece and put it in your pocket and went like this right just kept your mouth shut don't put make sure the media doesn't get it make sure in today's world you know social media i mean that information will travel at the speed of sound well at some point that suspect's going to going to come across that information and and you and i have both on been on cases i i interviewed wesley dodd years ago and he had kidnapped the kid long story short the first thing he did was turn the news on to see if there were any press conferences and what the sheriff was saying isn't that something yeah and then he went the opposite direction with the victim so it's critical just you know in an investigation to keep the flow down so cuz now they're going to have to start focusing on you know some other directions outside of having this video you can bet they've analyzed what we're doing here tonight you know uh, significantly and taken every word uh, that that he mentioned and i caught one other thing if i can say if i can mention it mike uh, that struck me odd, and, and tell me what you think. When he was talking about the cat, and I didn't, I didn't I haven't caught this until, uh, you know, we, we just watched it again. He said they dragged her away. So he puts plural into the cat. Okay, he keeps talking about we, them. You know, he he segregates the police into a different category from the we and then he puts it into the animal attack they they dragged her away and you know each one of those words has a tremendous value uh it's probably some of the best evidence that this case is, uh, is sitting on outside really, of some I of the other even, things i hadn't even thought of that Let, let's let's come back to to barry in a moment and okay his video uh when he when he talks um, I wanted to chat a little bit about the forensic evidence, the phone uh, forensics, social media information that's that's bouncing around. I mean, the public, uh, I think, you know, sometimes they take a pretty bad rap because they're so engaged and they want to know so much. But there is undoubtedly a huge amount of information that's coming from the public via social media by uh, cameras that are on uh, doorbells and and outside of residences and other things that that the forensics uh, have got to be just horrendous on this thing I, I was thinking even just as simple as looking at the location of the phone and we know that there was a personal item that was found and there's lots of speculation on that whether it's uh, you know a piece of clothing or a helmet or a phone uh, and I certainly don't know but but in looking at the phone, there's a couple of interesting things that I wanted to bring out, and, and we've talked about it before because law enforcement does like to look at phone data. There's a process called triangulation, and, and on the map that we're looking at, you can see I've indicated where the cell towers are around there. Everyone's complained about how poor the cell phone coverage is, um, but uh, this is the location of each of the cell towers around there. In order to get a location of a phone from the cell towers this old analog way of doing business it requires triangulation where three towers are selected and if you think about your iPhone or your Android phone when you look at the map on the phone and it shows you in the middle of the map with a circle around it it's basically using that triangulation to say you're somewhere within this area well without a what's called a rebid where you go back and you uh, request data from the phone or you recover the phone you can get the actual GPS location of the phone and that's coming off of a satellite signal that's much more accurate um, they, they've got a tremendous job ahead of them in trying to find that information and determine for instance where she was traveling or where a potential suspect might be traveling but it's really clear that as we look at that, that those kinds of things become really uh, intriguing. The other thing is to start thinking about the sex offenders that happen to be in the area. And we we went in and we started examining all of the sex offenders. And you can see uh, in the county, there are a bunch of them that are listed. Um, 
without without exposing too many names, even though the, the their public information, we went in and we analyzed all of the routes that they would have to take in order to drive to this location and get a victim in that place and head off somewhere else if we were looking at a sexual predator as part of the problem, one particularly who's on paper. But we can see, regardless of the, where their residence is located, there's really only one thoroughfare into and out of the area uh, to pull off this kind of a caper if it really was an abduction. I, I don't know what your uh, thoughts are on that, but I wanted to just mention that as we uh, continue to look at this. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's, that's a great analysis of, you know, some of the different lanes that are taking place, uh, right? I mean, I think we have, you know, everybody says, you know, this investigation, but I don't think the people, you know, the public, we, we really realize that there are so many avenues that are being, you know, looked at simultaneously. I mean, you have the forensics avenue, uh, you know, you have the cell phone you know, Forensics Avenue, like you're talking about uh, here and pointing that out. You also have additional interviews and canvassing. You know, you can bet, right, that somebody in CBI has pulled up every one of those, uh, we call them RSOs, right, registered sex offenders. They've pulled those RSOs up. They're looking for those, you know, those priority high risk. What's the victimology of these guys past? Who have they looked for? Does she fit that pattern? You know, uh, be, you know, and so they're they're quickly analyzing that information, and so it's going to be interesting to see what that to your point what that personal item is because if that's a cell phone, and you've you know pointed out some of the towers and stuff here and the triangulation of that, that's going to be critical in two paths, right? Um, it, because there's two cell phones. Right. That's right. The, That's right. the if the husband, yeah, if the hus well, there could be three, right? I there mean, could if, be many, actually, depending on who these pool yeah. of possible suspects might be. Right, and so they're going to try to want to triangulate what you just laid out here back to this personal item, uh, and if that's her, if you know, hypothetically, we don't know, so I'm not going to guess, but if it is, you know, a, a, a cellular device. Uh, I mean that that's going to be critical, critical piece of evidence, uh, because that that's going to be a huge story. Uh, yeah, I agree. It, yep. You know, we talked about the victimology. We haven't really talked much about the suspectology, and we don't know how many suspects there may be, or if there are even any suspects. There may be evidence that. Uh, completely supports that this woman crashed on a bike and, and fell into the creek and the river was running fast enough that it took her downstream and it's becoming a recovery effort. There are so many different scenarios, but um, tell me a little bit about the suspectology, the study of who some of the suspects might be. And sadly, we're the, the only one that we really know of, other than the boogeyman, is the husband. Who is he? Yeah, so what I've learned is, you know, uh, just through open source, right, is Barry is, you know, he, he's kind of, you know, he was that guy in high school, right? Uh, some of the, uh, I listened to an interview of one of the neighbors uh, or one of their past friends, and she's known them, you know, since high school. They were, you know, together. He was, the, he was that guy. He was a catch. Uh, the girls knew he was going to go places, uh, they're both very smart uh, people. Uh, they attend at Purdue University. Um, I, I believe he got his degree in uh, horticulture and you know landscaping. He was a professional landscaper. Had very successful businesses. Uh, they also owned a couple of additional um, you know businesses in Indiana where they where they're originally from. Uh, he was uh, a hunter. Um, we have evidence of that through the photographs of the home uh, that they sold. You can see some of the, the hunting things up on the walls and stuff. So, you know, he seemed like, you know, uh, when he got to Colorado, uh, he, you know, they fell right into the community and, you know, their community, you know, neighborhood group. Uh, one of the guys there was the fire chief of the local, you know, fire department and 
you know, enticed him to come work for him as a volunteer firefighter and went to the fire academy, you know, and, and really engaged and, you know, kind of left, uh, you know, Suzanne, uh, you know, as an independent woman, you know, they've been married 30 something years. And so she was doing her thing, uh, which, you know, we, we have a, an understanding of who she is. Uh, but, you know, he uh, just seems like your regular, you know, hard charger, you know, and, um, you know, but those kind of personalities as a whole, you know, uh, potentially could be somewhat dominant, you yeah. know, in, in relationships. So we don't know that yet, but, you know, the, he'd been described as, as potentially being, in, you know, that type of individual as well. You know, there's a lot of people that are uh, complaining online. <laughs> I, I know a police chief uh, in Texas who calls the complainers the community of 10. They have such a loud voice. They sound like there are more of them than there are. He, uh, these, these complaints are that, hey, wait a minute. This guy is saying he's at a training conference. His fire chief is saying, I don't know of what that would be because of COVID and other things, we really don't have anything going. Um, I, I don't know, what's the likelihood he is at, at training? And, and uh, again, is that will become one of those really important pieces of evidence that you can use to impeach someone in their discussion of what they're doing? Yeah, and, and going back to the what you pointed out, Mike, about the, uh, the cell phone, right? If, he, yeah. if, he's, if he's in Denver, well, you're gonna have a ping you're, you're going to find out pretty quickly if that's his phone, you know, pinging off those towers. Because when you start getting into those, you know, into that environment down there, there's a lot more, you know, shell activity that you're going to have to have, you know, some very positive uh, evaluation on. So. Yeah, this is, this is like the perfect case to, to talk about the five parts of evidence or the forms of evidence. I mean, we have this forensic evidence that's going on, the bicycle crash, uh, the, the forensics on the bicycle or the items that are recovered. We have eyewitness information that, that uh, may or may not be reliable. We have circumstantial evidence in this case that's really becoming intriguing. But as we explore all these forms of evidence, one thing that we do know is that a single form of evidence is not really valuable in court. There are anomalies in cases where a single form has been what was used to convict someone. Uh, and oftentimes that boils down to like an eyewitness testimony. But eyewitness testimony, this other form of evidence, is, is so un, unbelievably untrustworthy at times that we have to really be careful that we're using multiple forms of evidence. We have a, a video that we posted a short time ago that talks about those forms of evidence. But then again, the most, uh, the newest form and the, one of those that can really lend a lot of credibility one way or another is this idea of behavioral evidence. And uh, as you talk about this person that we're, we've been talking about, I want to just play on the screen now um, the uh, statement that he made uh, in the media. On it, and I believe it was on his Facebook page, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah. Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, we'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you, we miss you, your girls need you. No questions asked, however much they want. I will do whatever it takes to get you back. Honey, I love you. You know, um, I, I just found that interesting. I'm certainly not an expert in in uh, body language. I do understand some nonverbal cues, but on Crime Stories with Nancy Grace, uh, did you did you catch that session she did the other night where she had the body language expert Suzanne Constantine on the call with her? Did you catch that one, Chris? I saw it. Yeah, I listened to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, did you did you catch what she was saying? She she says, well, well, she begins with saying that she's really troubled by his words. Oh, Suzanne, uh, and she indicates, you know, usually when someone says "oh," there's uh, usually some really strong emotion with it. Perhaps it's fear, uh, maybe some sympathy behind it. 
she just felt like it was kind of an odd way to open up. And then, and then she talks about his use of the word if, if you can find her, if she's out there. Those kinds of things really struck her as being odd. Uh, Constantine went on to mention several other things that bothered her. But the final statement, uh, if I remember right, I love you and I miss you. Uh, she, she felt that his voice inflections were flat and monotone. It really caused her to, to question his truthfulness. I, I don't know. What, what, what did you think when you saw that? Well, you know, the first thing that, that catches me, the viewer of that particular just statement in of itself is immediately struck with an emotional response because you have the victim, uh, you know, on the side of him. So immediately you, you, the thought process is pulled into an emotional response to her. Okay? So no matter what he says, okay, you're gonna, people are gonna measure it against what they're looking at for her. Okay, so meaning, you know, if you kind of play it back for just a second here, you'll see. Yeah, I'm, just gonna, kinda, I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to get to that. I'm having a little yeah, bit of a tough no time right here. There we go. So you're okay. saying this part right yeah. here. With, yeah. yeah, I mean, okay, so there she is. Okay, so everybody is looking at her going, wow, okay, there's the victim. You know, they're, they're saying, wow, she just looks like, you know, she is your everyday girl. Yeah. Okay? And now... So he must be the monster. Okay, so let's listen what the monster says. Okay, and so that you you get these people that approach this stuff sometimes where they go, well, no matter what he says, okay, I'm going to listen to every single minutial, you know, piece of the puzzle here and hear things that, you know, just, you know, the tone, the, the whatever, okay. Uh, that's great. But what's more important is we now have evidence, i.e. Tyson's tape. What are the correlating statements to what Tyson picked up? And that word if, which the uh, Nancy's gal said, that's critical. Okay, because he also says in that statement, if somebody, if, uh, uh, if uh, anyone other than Okay, so he uses that, um, you know, and he pushes it to the other direction to using that, you know, word. He starts talking in plurals. Uh, and this goes back to the conversation about the cat, you know, they, we, them. So he's kind of, you know, moving himself away from, uh, you know, first person, which could be an indication of deception. Or it could be he's just a distraught husband who's been through the ringer uh, looking for his wife for the, you know, the duration of what just took place there. You know, yeah. and, and the evidence at that point will become significant based on, you know, the, the old saying, right? You know, the um, open mouth, insert foot. <laughs> do, you, do, you think it's, do you think it's unfair of people like us and others to try to judge a person based on a 30 second clip that probably has been scripted to do a number of things, maybe send a message to the victim if they actually get to see it, that people haven't forgotten them, or to send a message if the belief is that it's a, an abduction and he's really speaking to someone, or is it really him trying to, to say something? We don't know this guy. We don't know his background. What, what do you think of that? Well, and I think, you know, we come from that old school of, you know, stay on the road. And when the evidence, you know, tells you to turn, then you go down that road. And I think with technology today, you know, there's this impulse to immediately immediately you know that this is what it must mean okay well you know you and i both have been you know a couple of rodeos where you just go well you know it may have looked like that but that's not what happened 
Uh, and I think we're seeing the results of that in our society, uh, not only in this case, but many others, to a very quick judgment, to your point, Mike. So I think it's, I think these, again, it goes back to the way the investigators, and my two cents here, the way they're handling this case, they're keeping it very close to the chest. Uh, they, they've got something that they're, they're, they're sniffing. Uh, yeah, aren't you, aren't you proud of them? I mean, yeah, they're really doing a great job. Yeah, uh, you know, um, you uh, you and I talked about a reporter, Amber Cooper uh, from Fox Twenty One. Mm-hmm. She's been doing some pretty interesting work, and and uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play the audio on this. I want you to just kind of comment about a few things as uh, we we play her talking in the background on some of her threads. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not playing the audio, Chris. Oh, just letting. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. Just no, letting you. So, yeah, this is Lauren. So she's the. So these are these are two partners in the, um, uh, in the news business back there, right? So they're on the ground. So Lauren and Amber have been on this from day one. Uh, Lauren. So Lauren goes out there. She interviews, you know, some of the neighbors. Uh, she interviews the the fire chief, and she takes these very you know, meticulous notes, you know, back in the day, these kind of journalists, you know, in full disclosure are very dangerous. <laughs> you, know, you and I both know it's like, okay, what do they know? You know, it's like, you know, who's talking to the media, right? I mean, you love them to death. I ended up marrying a journalist. So I, you know, my sweetheart, I used to tell her, you guys are so dangerous. It's, it's unbelievable. But because they can, you know, if these gals or guys get a piece of information that you don't want floating into that environment, man, that just just really makes it difficult. But so this gal, she's on it. She's interviewing, you know, the neighbor. She's interviewing the fire chief, and she even calls the the chief a little chatty. Okay, <laughs> you know, she's. She's learned about the victimology of who Suzanne is, what her, what her friends talk about. She's interviewed family members. So she's got a lot of information uh, that, uh, you know, it, you, there was nothing worse than turning the TV on and seeing a journalist with a microphone in front of an eyewitness like Tyson, okay, who just did a, an interview with the suspect. Okay, <laughs> yeah. If that, right? Not saying that, you know, in this case, he's the suspect yet, but, you know, he does have a statement from Barry, uh, and, you know, you, you can't get around that. He, it is what it is, and that's strong evidence. So, uh, but they play a crucial role, too. You know, the, the media really is your friend uh, when they report the news honestly and correctly and right down the middle, in which, which these gals are doing up there. So... You know they're lucky to have them in that area. Quite frankly, yeah, um, agreed. They're, they're flushing so, things out. Mm-hmm. So, wh- where does this investigation go from here? I mean, they they are um, keeping the public o- aware of what's going on as appropriate. They've got this phone analysis and forensic stuff going on. They've got their interviews going. I mean, they're really they're really punching the ticket in all the ways uh, that need to be. Uh, wh- wh- where do they go from here? So you have a couple of lanes happening right now, right? Rather rapidly. Okay? You, you have the forensics analysis going on, not only of any physical evidence that may have been found, like the bicycle, uh, you know, whatever that personal item is. And if that personal item is, you know, digital related, right, then that's going to bring in a whole nother laboratory uh, to start analyzing what's inside of that digital footprint. Simultaneously, you know, you have to start eliminating what the possibilities are. So you, we saw that they went through, they did the dive, uh, you know, down, down the river. The, I think they brought in some resources to come, you know, uh, canvas that because, and the, and the bigger purpose for that is you and I both know Michael in court, is you want to be able to present to the district attorney every single rock that's been flipped over, whether it's plus or minus against you 
in terms of putting the case together, okay? The, the whole purpose of an investigation is to be neutral to the truth and the facts of that investigation. And sometimes it hurts, okay? Because the, the biggest problem an, uh, an investigator can get into is this tunnel vision. So, so backing up into you know, this, this idea of this investigation moving, you know, flowing forward, okay? The, the last thing you want to, to see happen is an investigator get into this you know, tunnel vision. Uh, because once they're in that tunnel vision, uh, it's, they forget and all of this other stuff is happening you know, around us. Okay? So you, you, know, you want to cut that down. And the, and the way that can happen is everybody has a, a lane that they want to stay in as a team. And you want to start asking the whys versus the hows. And you know, why was this victim selected? Why was this bicycle down there? Why did he walk up and start talking to Tyson? And, and then you start understanding, once you start connecting those whys, the how starts showing themselves. You know, how he did it, how, you know, this, you know, uh, et cetera, how the phone or whatever that personal item is got to where it got, okay? And that's paying attention out here, okay? All this other distance. And so right now where the investigation is, in, in my opinion, they've, they're regrouping, okay? They've done some things, they've done some digs, uh, you know, something led them to that property, okay? Uh, they had to get an affidavit and a search warrant to go dig that up unless they had consent, okay? And if the victim is, or the, the family is cooperating, or the property owner is cooperating, then you know they got cons they have consent to, you know, look through that area. Okay, whatever they may or may not have discovered, has to be documented and sent to the lab, and they're processing whatever that evidence is at this point. Simultaneously, you also have these other outliers, uh, the registered, you know, the RSOs. Let's, let's get them off the map. Let's eliminate them, okay? Or let's put them in the circle. Uh, either way, that evidence has to be flowing, uh, meaning, you know, interviews, canvassing, uh, you know, are there phone, are there ring, you know, are there, uh, you know, local video uh, information, you know, from, from, from uh, neighbors, et cetera. Um, and, so all of that stuff right now is being evaluated, and they're doing it, you know, probably uh, every other day. They're having a, a, a debrief, and they're figuring out, okay, this is where this chain is taking us, this daisy chain. And at some point, they're going to refocus their efforts. Uh, and I think we got an indication of that maybe even uh, today. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier, Michael, that were, were they back, uh, circling back? That's what I'm hearing is that they uh, served another search warrant on the house today. Yeah, so that's a flag. That's a, that's, a, that's a pretty good flag because that means they've gone down a road and they're able to say, you know, in court, well, we went down that road. Okay? And guess what? There was a, there was a sign that said dead end. Okay. <laughs> and they turned around and they went back and they said, okay, let's start again. Okay. So, yeah, that, those are all indications of, of, of good things happening. And I think we'll see a result here. You know. Yeah, I, oh. I agree. It, uh, th this, this whole final discussion has made me think about something that I wanted to put up on the screen. One of my favorite quotes. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, if you remember the, the famous Sherlock Holmes, he said it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data because insensibly one begins to twist the facts to suit their theories instead of the theory to, fa to beat or suit the facts. A uh, great statement and, and probably really good counsel for all of us as we look at a case like this um 
Chris, thanks so much. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, folks, this wraps up our discussion on the Suzanne Morphew case. If you have any information regarding this investigation, we'd ask you that you contact the Sheriff's Office or the FBI. Uh, I'd really like to thank Tyson Draper who joined us uh, tonight and especially thank Chris for joining me. Detective Chris McDonough, you can look him up online and read all about him. Uh, Chris, I think we ought to do this again. Why don't we uh, maybe look into the uh, murder of a little boy named Matthew Chechi that you investigated a few years ago. It's one of the most uh, uh, tragic cases I think I've ever uh, participated on the outskirts of, and you lived it intimately for, for many, many weeks. What do you think about that? Yeah, let's do it, Mike. I, um, you know, that story needs to be told. And quite frankly, uh, you know, I haven't really told it. Um, you know, I've held that uh, in my heart for, you know, a long time. So well, we I'd should love, talk I'd about love to participate. Yep, we talk about that. That little boy uh, is the impetus behind the child bathroom laws, isn't he? Where you can have a family restroom. Yes, correct. Yeah, let's yeah. maybe let's do that in a week or two, uh, folks. Good. I hope that you found this profiling uh, evil conversation segment to be helpful. I hope it was interesting. If it was. Would you please give it a thumbs up and stop by our website at www.profilingevil.com. You can leave a message there. You can register for upcoming broadcasts and you can even ask a question or two that we'll try to build into some future broadcasts. And, and please make sure that you like and share this YouTube channel. And, Hit and that sign subscribe up. button. Yeah, subscribe to it. We need... We need you to join up with us. And above all, remember that every community has a cadre of professionals who are standing by to ensure your safety. If you're being victimized by someone, get to a safe place as quickly as possible and call your local law enforcement agency, your physician, or your mental health provider. And until we get together again, please be safe.